thanks so much to all of you guys for coming out. Really super appreciate it, um, whether I forced you to come or not. <laughs> um, <laughs> I really do appreciate it. Um, and so does the rest of the board who's sitting up here and helping out in the back and just being wonderful. Um, so my name's Abby. I'm the president of IC Books Through Bars. Um, basically what we do is receive letter requests from incarcerated people across the nation. They'll ask for um, whatever books they want. So some people will just want comic books, some people want history books, some people want dictionaries, anything that you can think of. Um, we'll match them with books in our donated library and then send them out to prisons across the states um, at monthly mailings. So if you guys are interested, come see me, come see Brittany, who's at the laptop in the back. She can take down um, your email and we'll shoot you emails whenever we have those things going on. Um, but tonight we have an exciting event going on, um, and Emma's going to introduce our speaker, our performer. Hi everyone, I'm Emma. Oh, you're all getting up here. That's cool. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Emma. I'm the event coordinator of Books Through Bars, and we're very, very excited and proud to uh, have the spoken word poet, youth advocate, and uh, activist, Amin Drew Law, here from DC. Um, he has traveled around the country uh, doing performances and talks, and he's been featured on Button Poetry. Um, and he is here to, to, to perform his poetry, but also discuss literacy and incarceration issues. Um, so please give a warm welcome to Amin. Um, I want to be very, very clear about what's going to happen today, uh, or this evening. Um, anybody who's sitting in the back, if you can move up a couple of, a couple of rows, I see there's a couple uh, lip bites on the bottom, a couple and eh, trust me when I tell you, it's going to be a better experience for you and for me. Um, uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, be dangerous. Come to that first row if you want to be dangerous. That's really dangerous. <laughs> All right, we're gonna have to get the energy up in here. I hope that's okay with everyone. I, uh, uh, on a count of three, um, I want you to clap like uh, you woke up in the morning, you got a knock on your door, and it was Bay. Whoever Bay is for you, uh, Bay is uh, standing in front of you with a delicious cup of your favorite hot beverage, um, and on that hot beverage. Uh, there is like a froth in the shape of a tree or a squirrel. Um, I want you to clap like um, Beyonce just tweeted you. I want you to clap. I want you to clap. Like not only did Beyonce just tweet you, Beyonce decided to pay your entire college tuition. On the count of three. On the count of three. Because that's the only way we can wake up in here. One, and I want you to do it for real. I want you to really, you know, picture that moment. Wow, Beyonce, free college, amazing. Three, here we go. One, two, three. Good, 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 good. good. Um, we're gonna do we're gonna do a little bit of clapping uh, in this this opening. We have people to clap for. Um, uh, the, the the two fine human people that uh, introduced me, uh, Abba and Emmy. Can we get uh, Emma? Can we give them a round of applause one time? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's been a long time coming, I think. A couple months trying to trying to get this thing to work. Um, I have a I have my my sort of uh, set list here. Uh, if I feel that I need to move away from that, I will. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Amin Drulah. I'm a uh, Palestinian Egyptian American poet. Uh, I am a youth advocate. I am an advocate for human people in general. Uh, I'm a poet, I'm a two-time DC Grand Slam champion, four-time uh, Beltway Poetry uh, Slam team member. I am a Southern Fried Poetry champion. Uh, I have lots of accomplishments, lots of things like that. Um, tonight we're gonna laugh a little bit too. Uh, we're gonna laugh, we're gonna have a good time. Um, I, I often go and traverse different uh, college spaces um, for different reasons. Um, it may be because I'm Muslim, it may be because I'm Arab, it may be because uh, I've had experience in the uh, correctional facilities. Uh, it may be for a bunch of different reasons. They're all intersections of, intersections of who I am as a person. You also have several intersections of who you are as a person. Do not make yourself a caricature of one particular thing. Uh, so while I'm here, I will try to give you everything that I am. Um, we'll have a conversation 
uh, maybe surrounding um, uh, incarceration and, and what happens there. But really, we're going to talk about humans and, and what it means to be alive. Uh, I am really excited to be here, actually. Um, it is a beautiful uh, school you have here. Um, I hope you are interested in higher learning. Uh, and I hope you are interested in your own learning as well. Um, let's see what else I got in here. Uh, um, we're gonna, like I said, we're gonna laugh a little bit, but there are gonna be um, some poems that are gonna be very intense. Uh, so I'm just gonna give you a trigger warning now. Um, there will be conversations about uh, addiction, grief, loss, things like this. If you at any time feel the need to step out of the room, um, please feel free to do so. Uh, it will not offend me, I, I, I promise you. Um, before I get started, um, I just, uh, after this also we'll have a, a question, a Q&A, Q&A &A situation. Um, before I get started, um, I'm going to have to give you a little bit of rules about the spoken word community because that is the subculture that I uh, traverse the most. Um, and because I do that, I have to represent uh, spoken word and slam, so this is what's going to happen. Um, we're going to learn how to react, we're going to learn how to coexist, because I'm going to give you a lot of energy, I'm going to need a little bit of energy back. Uh, the first thing that you can do, if you hear something that you like, you feel something that moves you a little bit, uh, you can snap your fingers. Let me hear you snap your fingers like this. Mm -hmm. It's like a cricket orgy, it's beautiful, lovely, sexy brain. Uh, that's, that's, the snapping of the finger is very, you know, late 70s, have you ever seen the movie Love, anybody here seen the movie Love Jones? You don't have to watch it, it's cool, but that's where it, that's where it got started. Uh, if you if you like something, you can also do the chocolate stuck in the roof of your mouth noise, which sounds like mm. So on the count of three, let me hear your best mm. Here we go, one, two, three. Mm. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say something that's not deep at all, but after I finish saying it, I want you to go mm, and it's going to sound deep. Watch this. Exit signs. Mm. Right, it sounds deep no matter what you say. And a lot of poets get through an entire, they'll get through, they'll have an entire career where they're saying things that sound deep but really aren't, and people will just go, mm, they'll get book deals, it'll be incredible. <laughs> I'm just telling you, a lot, a lot, a lot of the people, uh, I'm going to just also preach because I'm, I'm getting older in life, even though I do have a baby face. Uh, uh, yeah, a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of things are pretend, a lot of people are pretend, and uh, you know, just learn what you want to learn. Um, okay, cool. I think I'm going to do some poetry. That's cool with y'all. Let me hear you say, yeah. Yeah. If you're really feeling good, like you want to enjoy what's going on right now, on the count of three, let me hear you say, hell yeah. One, two, three. Hell yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to start this poem. Uh, and it's about me growing up and being a kid. Yeah. <laughs> you're a troublemaker. <laughs> um, here we go. Oh wait, let me just check my subjects, is that right? Yeah. <clears throat> my first ever memory was laying in the bed with my mother. She told me not to get out until she woke up. Afraid I would go outside and fall down the stairs or drown in the sink or get stuck in the vacuum. When I was six years old, I watched Mickey Mouse hop out of the shower and jump feet first into his red shorts. The ease which magic is produced by gloved mice is astounding. I thought to myself, this whole time, my whole life, I was putting on my pants like an idiot. <laughs> so I put my clothes on a hanger, placed it on the closet ledge, and repeatedly jumped into the door. I remember my mother running in, in a towel, screaming, asking, asking if we were being robbed. I said no. She asked what I was doing. At that moment, I stood there, knowing that anything I said wouldn't get me out of trouble or help with my mom's belief that I didn't have sense God would give a goose. After that day, I started writing down my ideas instead of white snake dive, stage diving into poorly constructed suburban doors. But being a writer keeps you cold, bitter with vocabulary and revisions of grandeur bruised from beating your chest and recovering from lukewarm rejection. Advice, keep your stage left. Put your knee on the right side of the subway seats, kiss strangers, and never let your mother compare you to geese because beds are no place for children. Thank you, that's a poem. That's what we just got started right there. You can clap for that, that's okay. Um, so I mentioned a couple things that I, I want to get to all the intersections because intersections are important. Intersectionality is important with everything we do. Um, as we move forward in life, or as I move forward in life, um, 
if you don't know what intersectionality, you do. You're in college. I'm sure you know what it means. But uh, I always say it like this. Uh, I, I am Palestinian. I'm, I'm Muslim. Um, and I, I understand that um, even though there are particulars surrounding that, uh, I also understand that anti-Semitism is one of the most oppressive ideologies in the world. Um, so as I move forward and I'm an advocate um, uh, for, for, for uh, people who are Muslim or identifying that way, I also understand that people are hurt in other ways as well. Um, so with that being said, my father, uh, when, I, when I first was, I was born, I was with my mother. And at that time, uh, my father was stuck in Kuwait. He couldn't come here. Um, and it was, it, was, it, was a, it was a little bit rough, but uh, we had a good time. Um, and this is a poem about my name, uh, about, about that intersection. And uh, I hope you enjoy. Here we go. <coughs> My name is Amin, but everyone calls me Drew. See, Amin means honest, means trustworthy. Nobody calls me Amin. I'm often asked why I don't go by my given name. My answer, usually clumsy and underwhelming, a sort of snowball made of desert sand. In 2008, two years after my father passed away, I went to visit his family in Jordan. I saw some of them like Hiba and Dalia and Naida and Naila for the very first time, and they were very interested in this new moniker of Drew I was going by. Uh, who is Drew? Where is he from? He's not getting any of my tabouli. <laughs> my laugh after that is always a little awkward. One morning, I went to the grocery store with my grandfather, a proud man who shares my first name but wears his, like the Kuwaiti war medals he keeps on the top shelf next to his Quran. Before we entered the store, he slipped the Palestinian flag into my back pocket. As we picked over figs in the produce section, a man approached me, saw the flag in my pocket, and asked if I was Palestinian. Uh, la, la, Amriki, um, Arabia. There goes that awkward laugh again. When I got home, my grandfather pulled me to the side, looked at me in a way that only military men can, and said, you, I mean, are the son of my son, the bearer of my first name. You are Palestinian, so welcome to Palestine. Sometimes we bury our children here, where the light at the end of the tunnel is a checkpoint, where we have no statues, no land to bury them on. I will not lie to you. Some people would rather avenge their fathers than raise their sons. We are clumped and uneven like the soil we wish to have back. There will be other people that will mock you and say they have stolen your holy land. But I mean, it is called holy land. If God is inside all of us and we walk with our souls, then truly all the ground we touch is holy. I pray for the morning I wake up and nobody has a war story. All of my medals have been turned to dust. This is for my grandfather who died earlier this year and will never hear this poem. For my great grandmother who would speak to me for hours knowing I did not understand a lick of Arabic. And all of my cousins who only know me by my grandfather's name. So this is my coming out party. Hi, my name is Amin Andrew Amjad Dalal, named after both of my grandparents, holding out my family tree like an iron hammock. I know my flesh is of a half-breed, but my soul is a man from Nablus with a West Bay backbone and a craving for cooked yogurt and pine nuts. I know now. Your language is mine. Your fight is mine. Your pain is mine to the man in the grocery store. I'm Palestinian. And my name is Amin. Amin's honest. You can call me Amin. That's that one. Um, so, uh, I, I, I will say that um, any, any particular situation uh, where someone is incarcerated in any way, um, whether that be uh, on house arrest or whether it is in a maximum security <laughs> prison, um, it will affect you. And, and usually, when you are incarcerated, it's, it's, it's a product of your circumstance. Um, very, I, I find it um, very strange when people grow up with two parents and, and, and have things, um, are given all the social economic uh, benefits and, and privileges, um, end up in places like that. And, and often, uh, when you do commit crimes or do things that can get you locked up, it is a very slow, gradual progression where you don't feel like you're necessarily doing anything wrong. You're dealing with people, you're making transactions. Um, and especially if you're not uh, in a situation uh, where you're not violent, you know, there's, there's not a, a sense of remorse a lot of times um, because it, it really is just a sur survival situation. Um, my father, both of my parents, um, uh, did have uh, a lot of addiction issues. Um, and because of that, uh, 
your, your life is sort of flipped upside down um, because a lot of people who are addicts, a lot of people who are incarcerated, a lot of people who are incapacitated in that way have children, have people who uh, need them. So we're not just having a conversation about um, what it looks like when people are in, in the prison system or uh, in, in any sort of correctional facility. It's affecting those people and everyone else that surrounds them. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that, but uh, you do desperate things um, when, when, when you, you are in desperate times. Um, and this is a poem about my father. You're gonna hear a lot about my father. Um, and this is, uh, this is called My Father the Hourglass. <clears throat> my father wasn't a violent man. I wasn't spanked often. But when I was, it was a spectacle. My dad enjoyed a hefty slab of cow skin he kept around his weight, waist. His stiff beatings always came with a saying that didn't make a whole lot of sense. I mean, a rabbit in the desert never digs a hole. I'm not sure how this pertained to me stealing bologna from the fridge, but English wasn't his first language. I was 12 years old when he spanked me for the last time. He stopped when I didn't tear or brace. He lowered his hands and walked out, his own tears in his palms. He and I did not get along three years before he died. There is plenty of uneven drywall in the old townhouse to prove it. When I was 17 years old, my father, fresh out of another brief stint in jail, kept us up with the white noise of an addict. Me, dreading the AM commute of a high school senior, became a ruptured beehive. I came downstairs with a type of rumble that shake men. I was told that rage is just anger and sadness at the same time. My father has seen such emotion before, knows the signs of its validity. He has always known me as an unselfish fire. He has never seen me with such malicious vigor. I raised my hand. For every missed football game, every bail bondsman pin in my pocket, every middle school visit he came for my urine sample, I saw the horror on the lines of my father's forehead now, a collection of colorless puzzle pieces, had no way to fend off my ache of madness. He braced, and it broke over both of us, this spiteful pendulum we had created. The man that read Quran with me cut my hair and laughed at my impersonations of his wife, now something to be reprimanded and discarded. We both cried that night, learned that love is a quiet victory, that addiction cannot be beaten away, only cared for, a doorstep at the edge of a desert, its sand must be brushed away daily now. I am a sweeper of deserts who uses no broad strokes, cares for each grain as if it were to be placed in an hourglass. That's a poem right there. Bow, you can clap for that if you want. Um, I'm gonna do something. I'm gonna I'm gonna break up the monotony a little bit. This is a short poem. Um, I, I want you. Anybody here grow up a chubby kid? Anybody here grow up a chubby kid? <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Hey, let that body shame stuff. Let that go. You know what I'm saying? If you grow up a chubby kid or you're a chubby kid right now, it doesn't matter. And if you're if you're not chubby anymore, but you grow up a chubby kid, it's still a part of you. You know what it is. And maybe you weren't chubby. Maybe you were too skinny, too skinny, or too short, or too brown, whatever it was. You got picked on probably. And if not. You were probably the asshole that was picking on people. <laughs> so I grew up a chubby kid. This is a short poem. When I say short poem, I want you to say short poem. Short poem! Short poem! This is entitled, The First Signs of a Rebel. <clears throat> I remember when my second grade teacher said, I couldn't eat my gingerbread house. I looked at her like, lady. <laughs> Me and you both know I'm eating this gingerbread house. <laughs> and that's the poem, thank you. <laughs> um, so, uh, so yeah, so I have, um, I, I've been a poet for about a decade now. Uh, I have been writing and, and, and trying to express myself through artistic mediums ever since I can remember cognitive thoughts in any way. Um, and, I just want to say that uh, often people say things like writing saved my life, and uh, I don't want to say that writing saved my life, but it definitely gave me a life. Um, and I think if, um, just I just want to kind of bring everything back. So when, uh, the first time I, I went to, uh, first time I was incarcerated, first I just want to be very clear right now. Um, I, I was not in, in any way 
I, I've, I've never been to a, a maximum security prison. Uh, I have never uh, spent a year or anything like that in jail. Um, I, I, I have been twice, um, brief stints. Uh, it's still terrible, it's still miserable, but I wanna be very uh, upfront with that. Um, but uh, the thing about it is, is we all, we all understand what being triggered is. We all understand, you know, I, think, I think we do. Um, um, being triggered essentially is just uh, when you have a, a traumatic experience um, and in and, and whatever way that traumatic experience is triggered um, and you uh, return back to that place you were at, at that time. Um, so anytime, anybody who comes out of uh, any sort of correctional facility, whether it be a, a, lot, of, a lot of young people um, go straight from uh, you know, group homes and, and, and juvenile placements directly into an adult prison. So the first time I went to an adult prison or adult jail, uh, I was 18 years old. And uh, it's, it's gotta be the most nerve wracking thing you can, you can imagine because I'm essentially still a child um, in there with, with grown adults. Um, so anytime um, something r reminds me for, uh, uh, about that particular situation, you can be triggered and it does hurt and it's a perpetual thing. And if you do not go to therapy, you don't work that shit out with another person, it will stay with you forever. So if you're dealing with some situations, even if it's just daddy issues, even if it's just, you know what I'm saying, get picked on it, whatever it is, they are real issues and you have to work them out. Um, you know what I'm saying? So I just want to advocate for anybody in here who's thinking about, you know, therapy or, or, or using art, you know what I'm saying, as a therapeutic uh, outlet, please do so. Please do so. Talk to me after the show. Ask questions. I can tell you more about that. Um, there are lots of ways to do that. I'm going to keep this thing going with the poems because that's what I do. I'm a poet. Um, so I uh, make some noise if you, like, for real got a best friend. Like, you know exactly who it is. Yeah, 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 make some noise, make some noise, make some noise. Uh, so um, what's interesting, what's interesting about growing up um, in a family uh, that is dysfunctional, many families are dysfunctional. I think, I think, I would say to not have a dysfunctional family is truly not to have a family. Uh, so <clears throat> what, what happens is, is you experience uh, dysfunctional families, you, you, you're hanging around your friends, you go over their houses, um, and, and, and there's, cert, there's a certain type of dysfunction that becomes taboo. Um, I think addiction is, is certainly a, a, a taboo uh, dysfunction. Um, and what ends up happening is you try to hide a lot of things from your friends. Um, and you have, uh, you have a hard time doing that when you're young. You're not, you're not as good as lying that you are when you're an adult. Um, and you, you have less reason to lie. Uh, but when you're a kid, especially as masculinity teaches you to lie about everything, all the things, it begs you to lie and pretend that nothing terrible has ever happened and you always have everything under control. Um, so, um, in, that way, in that way you're affected as well. Your friends and everything are also affected. This is a short poem. When I say short poem, I want you to say short poem, short poem. Short poem. Um, and uh, it's just about, it's about uh, the, the night. Um, this is about the night my father died. Um, my father actually died of a uh, uh, cocaine and methadone uh, Oxycontin overdose. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so this is, this is based off of that particular evening. Uh, here we go. <clears throat> I once let my friend borrow $40 and he told me he'd pay me back soon. Long story short, he didn't pay me back soon. For years he didn't. We graduated high school and he didn't. We went to our first club and he didn't. He bought his first abstract painting and he didn't pay me back. On his 24th birthday, he got drunk and I saw him cry for the first time. He told me that my dad was the only father he'd ever known. And now, this is all we share in common, that we are fatherless sons. I've never heard the phrase, I love you, said in a room we've shared by either of us. No one taught us that hallelujahs mean nothing when they're whispered, or that masculinity is no protection from spooks. We're grown now. We know monsters can lift blankets and wolves don't eat grandma's clothing to devour us. Me and him come from fathers who lived in countries where the house plants were a desert. I need to tell you that you're my brother, and I love you, and one day I'm going to pay you back, I swear. Mm -hmm. Clap for that one as well. Um, so I, I do this thing called slam poetry. Uh, there's lots of outlets for slam poetry. Um, they have an organization called Cupsy. 
I'm not going to tell you that it's the best thing ever, but it does exist, and it's for people who are interested in doing slam poetry uh, in, uh, in the college atmosphere. Uh, they exist all over the country, all over the world. Um, if you are interested in slam poetry, uh, I think you guys were talking about the butt button poetry video. I'm going to talk a little more about that. Um, but there are so many different uh, places uh, where you can catch it. Um, button poetry is an example. Also, uh, slam find. Uh, is another example. Uh, I have a bunch of different things. If you're interested in that, come talk to me after the show. I would love to get uh, love to get you more involved in something like that. Um, so what ends up happening is it's poetry and it's competitive. Uh, and you compete uh, against other poets from around the country and around the world uh, to see which judges randomly think you're the best. It doesn't make you the best poet. It's a completely, it's a, it's a game. It's completely arbitrary. Um, and it means nothing, but it's a great place to have community, it's a great place to put on a show, and it's a great place to cut your teeth as a writer. Um, and also, it allows a space where you can be as honest as you would like to be. Um, and in general, in life, being on, as honest as you would like to be is an impossibility, um, or it comes with a lot of different taboos. So I'm very happy and I'm very glad that I found spoken word poetry. Um, once again, it didn't save my life, but it did give me a life. Um, this is a poem, these, these next two poems, or the next few poems I'm going to do um, are poems that I usually only s perform uh, in, in slam settings um, because it is the context. Uh, there is, it's going to be an intense situation. Um, feel free to laugh, feel free to cry or, or leave the room or whatever you need to do. Uh, this, um, this poem is entitled uh, Clear Liquor or How to Survive a Wreckage. We all remember the first time we tried vodka. At least I do. I was 12 years old. I was with my play cousin. We snuck into his mom's cabinet, pulled out the coolest bottle we could find, and chased it with Kool-Aid. And the next morning, my eyes were as red as Kool-Aid. That morning, I was so hungover, I almost drowned in the community pool. My play cousin, didn't console me or offer me a hand, something I was used to when I played games with my play cousin. I've heard addiction can run in the family. I do not know when my mother first took her first shot of vodka, but I do know when she was 13, her and my play cousin's mother drank moonshine and dreamed of husbands. I'm not sure when my father took his first shot, but I do know that him and my play cousin's father met in Kuwait and years later did cocaine in Florida without our mothers. I do not know what my father was like before my mother. I suppose he wasn't my father then, just a boy, like I was, who learned how to mourn his father's stolen country, like I do, who learned how to walk with the lights off, who cried into a shadow when his mother wilted into a desert like mine did. Me and my father both learned how to deal with grief. He did by playing soccer. I did when I learned how to eat cereal with a fork. My dad burnt all the spoons shooting up in the bathroom. My mother learned how to cope by curling into a ball, hoping this would stop me and my father from fist fighting. It usually didn't. One night, when my father screamed a white noise of addiction so far into the air and turned the sky into a ghost, I came downstairs, pushed him to the ground, stood over him. That moment, my father turned back into a boy without a mother like I am. I said, son, I never meant for it to be this way. I love you like an ocean that could kill me. On those nights, the only way we could deal with the grief was praying for each other and ourselves. My play cousin was kicked out of the military for being mentally unstable. God only knows what violence made him too violent for grief. My sister asks, when are we too old to be orphans? My parents kiss each other in heaven. When they died, I did not have enough money for the tombstone. I know now that grief is a mass grave. It is the reason I do not have children of my own, wary of the questions they will ask about their grandparents. The last time I had a shot of vodka was in 2008, and like my father, I did it to cure this loneliness, but I'm learning that grief is not chips on a bingo board, and it's not a fighting word, and it's certainly not a drinking game. Grief. It's drowning in a pool full of lifeguards who only ask you why you haven't learned how to swim yet. That's a problem. Thank um, to bring it back to intersectionality, um, 
Well, first, let me tell you a little bit about uh, what it's like to be <clears throat> um, incarcerated in the way that I was incarcerated, which is very different than the way that some people are. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a nonviolent uh, drug offender, so you exist in a world that is sort of separate from people who are violent or, or people who have different charges, things like that. Um, so when you're on C block, C block is the nonviolent offender block uh, often. Um, you kind of just hang out all day and play volleyball in booty shorts because they give you booty shorts for some reason. There's a bunch of grown men in pink booty shorts running around. I, it's funny, it is. I, I, I can't lie. It's, it's ridiculous and everyone's completely used to it. Uh, guys with tattoos on their face in, in booty shorts. And they're like a light, like a light red. Um, and uh, just to your particular point about the books, um, I, I guess I didn't think about this until we, we started going back and forth and I was thinking about this because um, I mainly just watched TV uh, while I was uh, while I was there. And I was 18, I was 18 year old and once again when I was 20. Um, but the books are pretty, they're pretty shitty. Um, like you can learn about like Hummingbird, it was like, I remember there was like a Hummingbird book that you would read if you were like 13 that told you all about hummingbirds. Um, and they're like, mag like random magazines from 2001 and all kind of, kind of a lot of bullshit actually. Um, and what I was also thinking about is a lot of it is, a, is like propaganda. It's just like America, American exceptionalism. It's a lot of that propaganda that's involved. Um, so what ends up happening is especially you, you, you really start to blame yourself um, because everyone blames you. When you go to jail, everyone blames you. There is nobody that is like, maybe you have a couple of friends who, who try to hold you down, but you will be blamed for so many things. I, I can't tell you how incredibly triggering it is to pass by any sort of prison system, any sort of jail system, um, because, because of my particular uh, circumstance. I do a lot of work in uh, juvenile detention facilities or uh, correctional facilities in general, it is very triggering to go through those gates. Um, I don't know if you've ever been to uh, any sort of lockdown facility. I can tell you right now, when you go to a lockdown facility, they put on a show for you. Uh, there, <clears throat> the first time, uh, when you go into jail, uh, you go into like a, a smaller uh, population unit. Um, and I can remember the first time I was there, Somebody was sort of talking a lot of trash or whatever. Um, this dude must have been in his 50s or 60s. Uh, and they just pushed him to the ground and they beat the hell out of him, right in front of us. Um, and, and people were just glancing over. Uh, the guys, they come in, they stare you in the face and they tell you, does anyone got anything to say? Because I will whoop everybody in here. Um, you go to a situation before you go to general population where you sit, <clears throat> uh, everyone has a little room, two to a room and you have one toilet and the toilet is in the middle of the floor. So we could be right here, okay? And right over there, right where you're sitting, the same lady right here with the water bottle, that's where your toilet is. So if you need to use the bathroom in any regard, um, you're gonna have to do it in front of everybody, right in the middle of the floor. And the only reason they do that is to dehumanize you. Um, so, as we talk about all those things, and all of uh, the intersectional topics, and all of those things, I wanna just, uh, one, one more time, can we just give a round of applause for this organization just one time? Round of applause for this organization one time. It is important work. It is important work. Um, uh, uh, there, phones, just, just getting a conversation with people you love is difficult. Um, you don't, like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm going vegan January 1st. I'm taking a plunge. I'm taking a plunge. Uh, <clears throat> there is no possible way you can be vegan. There's no way. There's no, it, really, there's no way. Um, the food sucks regardless, um, but, you know, it's, it's just, it's a difficult situation, and what I really want to get across here is there is no solution to incarceration. It has to be abolished in all regards. Um, any, any caging of a human being, uh, it, it is, there is, it, sometimes you have to remove people from society. I understand that, and it's called uh, restorative justice, and it's called rehabilitation in a real way, and it's not about hurting and punishing people. Um, so as you move forward, as we're all moving forward and finding these ways that we can help in the now, um, we, we also have to push for the end of mass incarceration, period. Um, you can clap for that. Please clap for that. <laughs> because you will get a stigma regardless. I mean, if you come out with a major felony, I mean, these are not things that you guys don't know. Of course, of course you understand, but 
that when you see it happening to individual people, um, because I was a baby-faced kid the first time I stepped into a facility like that, and there were people that I was worried about, like, how are you going to survive in here, bruh? Um, like, baby-faced kids, for real, who were in there for speeding. And I was, both times I was incarcerated was in the state of Virginia. And the state of Virginia is not a place you want to get locked up in. Uh, it's a commonwealth. They sent you there for any old reason. Um, I rarely travel to Virginia because I'm just afraid I'm going to get arrested. Um, so with all of those things being said, uh, this next poem I'm about to do uh, was the, sort of the poem that, that's kind of gotten a little viral. Uh, a little tiny viral, not for real viral, like pretend viral, like uh, 91,000 views, I think is the last time I saw it, 91,000, it's not bad. Uh, <clears throat> um, and I really appreciated this poem, if I can be emotional for a moment, and I'm always emotional. Uh, a lot of people told me that people wouldn't understand this poem. Uh, a lot of people, surrounding good people, my friends, people who are poets, um, you know, we're very, we're very nervous about sending this poem up. Uh, they were very nervous about how it was scored. These are things that we deal with in the slam world. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm of course, I'm, I'm past the, that part of my life where I care about scores and care about those things. I want to say the things that I want to do. I want to talk my shit. I want to live my life. And I'm not really interested in what other people got to say about that. You should live that life as well. Um, and so, so the fact that this poem is probably uh, my most, uh, has the most notoriety for me, means a lot to me. Um, it also was on this web, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to that after this poem, um, if I can remember it. Um, this is probably gonna be my second to last poem of the evening before we get started to the q and I would good on time in that regard, cool. Um, yeah. This poem is entitled Unsaid. <coughs> When you go to jail, the first thing they take from you is your shoelaces. I thought so they could break your dignity, show their authority, so you don't hang yourself. They ain't tell me that. I'm here because I used to sell Oxycontins. 20, 40, 80 milligrams. My job now is to be a barcode and listen to people that hate me. I didn't grow up poor. They call it a uh, lower middle class. All I know is I got food stamps and all my clothes came from a place where the price tags were written in Sharpies. This is not an easy job. But you want to make relationships. Maximize profits by going to the rich neighborhoods. Always easier to sell to the suburban kids. We got a saying around here. Sellouts are the best buyers. You know in the state of Virginia, when you're a felon, you got a petition to get your right to vote back. I learned more about this country here than I did at Watkins Mill High School. But now that I'm a felon, I can't vote? That's ironic, yeah. I always thought irony was for British comedies and white girls with guitars. I used to write a lot as a kid. I kept some of the journals to remind myself my mother's son is not a wicked man. What they don't tell you is all the addicts get stuck in your head. They're not all junkies and college tweakers. They're semi-pro athletes with no insurance. They're construction workers with herniated discs. They're mothers who taught me how to tie my shoelaces. Both of my parents died of overdoses. I paid for their funerals with drug money. There goes that irony again. A poet's been coming to the prison lately. She gave me something called a, uh, a writing prompt. Start a poem with the sentence, if the streets could talk, but I'm not much of a writer anymore. Every time I try, I see my parents' blood on my own fingertips. So again, if the streets could talk, my hand shakes through the page. All the guards flinch when I stand, but she tells me it's okay not to write, that listening can do just as much. So I do. Today, she read from a collection of works. One of the poems said, the world's breath is what we call silence. And they get so quiet in here. You would think prison and ungoverned clamor, but it is still windless. So again, if the streets could talk, no. If the streets could talk, no. If the streets could talk, I think that I got it now. If the streets could talk, I wouldn't. I've seen what happens to those that do. Faces bled into the asphalt. I want to remind myself 
I can still th make things beautiful. Carved my parents' name into a tree. Tell my father that he was a fireman, but I turned him into a furnace. I wrote all of these things in my journal tonight, but I dare not tell a soul if I did. They all think I want my shoelaces back. There's a difference between getting taught something and learning something, you know? And, and if any advice I can give you, I'm not that old, but I'm probably older than y'all. Uh, if anything, take all your ideas and just put them to the test. And if they're right, they'll always pass the test. Um, but don't be afraid to do that. Uh, and, and just for, for, for everything that y'all are doing and moving through the world, um, it's also important just to be a kind person, uh, even when you feel like you've been wronged. Um, because you've hurt people. Everyone in this room has hurt people. So you have to you have to forgive you have to forgive those people for hurting you, and you also have to forgive yourself for hurting people. Um, and I lost both of my parents within about a year of each other, both two drug overdoses, while I was still selling drugs. Um, and I'm gonna tell you right now, it took me a long time to forgive myself for doing that, uh, and it took me a long time to stop blaming myself for things that I really didn't have much uh, control over. Um, I'm going to do one last poem, and then we can do a Q&A. It's going to last as long. I don't know. Are we good? Okay. Um, I don't want to end on this, this somber note. Uh, um, so <clears throat> this is going to be, I'm going to do a haiku, and then I'm going to do a poem, and then that, we'll, we'll, we'll end it. Uh, this is a haiku. Um, I, I, if I mess it up, you're not going to care. It's fine. <laughs> the longest relationship I've ever had is with my weed man. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I remember I told you I was a chubby kid. Um, this is a poem about being a chubby kid. If you like it, um, snap and, mm, and do all the things. Uh, and that's going to be after we'll do a Q&A. And thank you all for having me. I had such a good time. You have a beautiful school. Um, please learn what you need to learn. And if you have to, you know, burn this motherfucker down at some point, you can do that as well. <laughs> I knew that one was going to get you. Right. Uh, uh, my whole life, I have been somebody my mother would consider big boned. But after much of my life searching for fat skeletons, I realized she's probably making that up. In reality, I was a fat kid. In a high school, was like a jungle. And I was like a walrus. But the cool kids, the ones with the clear skin and the ball bearings in their hips, well, they were lions. And I wanted to be like them. Their paws, swagger striped Air Force One's manes that resemble baseball caps like the Giants and the White Sox and the Yankees. And then there was me. The kid that during soccer games and field hockey games always played the fabulous position of goalie, I decided that if I were to be a lion, I would first need a mane. I would first need a fitted hat. So, started saving up my lunch money. Huge accomplishment for any fat boy. <laughs> and after two weeks, finally had enough of the hat. So I went to the mall, stepped into the store, growl ready, looking to earn my main hats like the Giants and the White Sox and the Yankees. My head was too big to fit any of those hats. But the cashier gave me hope. She went into the back and pulled out a brand new Detroit Tigers hat. The Tigers had lost 106 games that year. Proper metaphor for my high school romantic life. The next day, <laughs> I was just a chubby kid with the wrong hat. But what I didn't know is that the tiger is the heaviest of the jungle cats. It is the only member of the big cat family that has no audible roar. It growls at a frequency so low that humans can't hear it. Well, that was the problem. These humans just couldn't hear me. They were prowling around the wrong shrubbery, whispering around cats too small for my stripes. Now this, this, is what us chubby boys must do. Not puff out our chest, not make alarms out of our throats. We must whisper into the tall grass, gentle but jarring. I mean, who was I kidding? I was no lion, no walrus, but a tiger, scarce and unassuming. The symbol for personal strength, the symbol for invincibility, and the mascot for the best damn cereal in the game. <laughs> it is true. 
tiger's roar makes no sound. But its low rumble has always been known to shock and stir its praise to all of my chubby kids to not stay hidden in that brush too long. This ain't me and I hear you. They sure ain't hella gonna feel you. Thank you so much. So uh, my, my opinion on that is, unfortunately, uh, opioid addiction is, a, is really uncurable. Um, and it, it, it does, um, I, I, don't, I don't know the answer. I don't think people do know the answer. Um, and I think what we have to start doing really first is just uh, taking that stigma away. Um, if you have ever seen, and, and this happens, if you've ever seen someone going through withdrawal, from an opioid uh, addiction or a heroin addiction, it is a very scary thing. Uh, I ate too many edibles one time, and I was wigging out out of my mind. I thought I was going to die. Um, and a heroin withdrawal is uh, I, I just really wouldn't I wouldn't wish it up, wish it on my worst enemy. Um, so I I don't know if the information is there. I don't know if uh, the the I don't I don't I, I know what you're talking about and I, and I think it's it's a, it's a really new thing. Um, any sort of solution that we may have to deal with this particular epi and it's an epidemic. Opioid addiction is an epidemic on a the crack era level. The problem is is that it's often done by. <laughs> Now, people that are not of color, so they, they, they lower it down, you know what I'm saying? It, it happens in, in, in wider states and wider areas, um, and because of that, uh, the information isn't out there as much. Um, so I don't know, but I am for any type of, uh, any type of uh, research, any type of solution that people may have. Uh, I'm interested in going down whatever uh, rabbit hole that that exists in. Um, and it's better than what we've been doing, which is throw them in jail and watch them deteriorate. Uh, and it's it's a scary thing. Um, so I don't I don't know if that didn't <laughs> give you an answer, um, but uh, yeah, any any solution, anything you want, anything we want to try, I'm for. It. Any other questions about any? Yes. Uh, we want to thank you for caring for us today. It was amazing. To, um, what piece of art can you always go back to at any point in your life? You can always feel connected to whether whether you are you happy or whether you want something terrible, or if there is if there even is a piece of art that you always get connected to. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that there's there's plenty of art uh, that I I can go back to. Um, there's an artist called Frank Ocean. So anytime I feel any kind of way about anything. Listen to Frank Ocean in some capacity. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, uh, so yeah, I would say uh, I would say Frank is a, a big influence for me in my darkest moments. Um, poets of, of all kinds. Uh, uh, there are people who go through everything, and there are people who do art about everything. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I would say that. Um, a big influence in my life um, are, are just the poets that sort of surround me, the people who I get to see um, take a piece that is sort of just kind of uh, existing in an emotional state and refine it and turn it into something where everyone can sort of enjoy um, and everyone relate to, because that's really what art is, you know what I'm saying? It's the relatability that, it, that sort of exists in a gray area that you can't have a regular conversation about. Um, but yeah, music, poetry, I don't know if uh, there's, Several. There's a movie called uh, <clears throat> uh, "Beasts of a Southern Wild." It's an incredible movie. Uh, I find myself watching it all the time uh, when I need to be moved. 
Um, because really the best art is the art that you can be moved by. Um, and I think, I, I don't know what the proper term, uh, the, the proper definition for being moved is, but I, I think everyone here can sort of understand what that context is. Uh, yeah, and there's, there's tons of art, tons of art. I, I couldn't hear that we'd be here all day. And then, anybody? Yes. Um, so like, throughout history, like, you have to be like, most political There's a short answer and a long answer. Uh, the short answer is money and racism. That's really where that exists. Um, if, uh, if, if you were to, is just, if you are to remove uh, mass incarceration and all the money that flows into it, the economy will collapse. That is really what it is at this point. Um, and the second thing is, you wanna lock up people of color. That exists in every part of the country in all ways. Um, it's the reason why Marijuana is still illegal in a lot of places because you can smell it. Uh, most people who are not of color do it inside of a house. Um, so, you know, you, it, is, it is really a part of that creation to lock people of color up, period. There's no, there's not a, if you really look at the, uh, the history of it and you really look at the, the facts underneath that that's really what it is. So, in the, in, there is no political climate that exists where people are against mass incarceration. They may be for, uh, a restructuring of mass incarceration, but there will never be an end to caging human beings because it's a part of the economic you know, structure that we live in today. Um, so whether it's Donald Trump or whether it's Barack Obama or whether it's Ronald Reagan or whether it's Harry Truman, they're all interested in locking people of color up in all capacities. And it, you know, that's, it's never gonna come from, and like, and like you said, all these different movements that exist never came from a political standpoint. They came from the people. They came from civil disobedience. They came from, revolutionary ideologies. Um, so, once again, no, no easy answer for that. All we have to do, I think, is continue to help human beings as they exist right now, as we also reject every conversation that is being had by these people who are politicians or these people who are advocating for certain things, because it's really, it's just not, it's a joke. It's all pretend, and people aren't really interested in saving human lives, they're interested in getting elected and moving forward, and really that's it. Um, that's the long answer. Yes? Um, is there anything you would recommend, uh, or like anything that people are especially could do um, to like join in the activism that mass incarceration, like any everyday activities you could just start doing? Um, I would probably have a conversation uh, with Abba and Emmy, uh, uh, Emma, I call you Emmy, I don't know. Uh, and Emma about, about that particular thing. Um, the thing about activism and the thing about uh, the thing about helping people in the now is that the capitalist racial power structure is always against you at all moments and all times. And they will allow you to work within that. They will never allow you to work outside of it. Um, but I think I think honestly when I thought of, uh, when, when I was you know what I'm saying incarcerated, the things that you want um, are the ability to communicate with your family, uh, the ability, you know what I'm saying, to have, uh, you know, uh, something in your consumer area, you wanna be able to, to eat some, some food that's decent. Um, you know, like I, I don't necessarily deal with um, what exists, you know what I'm saying, in the inner workings of it, because it's all trash to me. None of it exists in a way that I can fix. Um, which is not, which sucks because it's not an answer that I can give you and tell you to go do this thing. Um, but I think honestly, the way you move throughout the world, the conversations that you have with people, it, I, I think it's like sort of, uh, it's it's just not it's just not an answer that that makes a lot of sense. And most of the answers are difficult answers. Um, so there's the, the everyday thing is. You, you, you want to be able to have education, you want to be able to have communication with your family and the outside world, um, and any conversation that surrounds 
minimums and these kind of things, you just have to be vocal on them. Uh, because the tangible things that we can do about mass incarceration, is they're, they're, they're little to none unless we are talking about the end of it completely. Um, you know, so that's, that's what I got for you. Yes, yeah, so we'll go here and then we'll go here. Hi, um, we have a program called the Series of Arts Programming at a global review of the Trenton facility. Do you have any advice about how we can create a more like, supportive space for these individuals? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, so, I think throughout, uh, I'm a facilitator of art. That's really what I do now. Um, I think the first thing that uh, you can do in, in a general way is uh, bring something that allows people to have conversations about their individuality. Um, and if, if you are able to connect with people on any emotional level, it doesn't matter what they write. It doesn't matter what, uh, what subject they do. It doesn't matter if they write at all, actually. The only thing that you can create, because like, I can come to some, like if someone were, I was a pretty, I can, I, would, I can handle myself when I was, you know what I'm saying, in, in, in an incarcerated space. I could imagine if someone came to teach me a writing class or something like that, I would look at you like you're crazy. I'm dealing with real, I'm dealing with real shit in here. Um, and it's just patience and it's, and usually they're very, people are very respectful, you know what I'm saying? Because anytime you have contact with the outside world, people are really respectful to it. Um, I think that the first thing is, is the writing doesn't make a difference. None of it makes a difference other than the connection with people. Um, and sometimes that's difficult when there are um, cultural boundaries. Um, because if you don't speak the same language as people, it's difficult sometimes to uh, communicate with them. Um, and it'll just be a lot of smiling and, and things like that. So once again, it's not necessarily an easy answer for you. Um, but, I mean, if you, if you need, conversation always needs to start with people who have been a part of the system to go back into the system so you can have that connection. People with cultural similarities, because different languages are always spoken. Um, but the writing, the, the writing doesn't matter, none of it matters. All that matters is there is a community of human beings that exist to help people. It doesn't matter if they're reading Dr. Seuss, as long as there's a community that exists. Um, so I would just say, uh, once again, not a tangible answer, but um, the creation of community and the creation of humanizing people who are completely dehumanized um, is a thing. And I'll allow them to take it wherever they need to go, even if there's no writing. Thank you. I have no, yes. Um, how did you get involved in SLAM and the SLAM team? Um, so I started off, um, I, I rapped for many, many years. Uh, I was in a band for many years. Um, and those particular subcultures, weren't really pushing the envelope for me in a political way or uh, a progressive way. Um, so I sort of hung around people who were poets and started doing that. Um, I really fell into it, which most people do because it is sort of an abstract subculture. Um, and once I, what I fell in love with is the community. The, the, the act of me performing, I could do that in really any context, not, not to hype myself up, but I'm a performer, that's what I do, you know what I'm saying? So uh, the community in of itself is a very progressive community. Um, it places a lot of value on humanizing people and humanizing intersections. It puts a lot of value on uh, disenfranchised people. It allows them to have space that they're not used to.